thing that you've been, you know, or you've mentioned more than a few times this year when we've we've talked is how uh, it, how hard it is to predict uh, any game this year. And do you think the tournament uh, has represented how it's been through the season? Yeah, I think so. I think the fact that there's a 15 seed for the first time in the Sweet 16 and Florida Gold Coast yeah. shows you that this is one of those years that you've never seen before. And you look at some of the upsets, you look at Gonzaga, who lost in the round of 32. And, um, you know, some of the other teams that have snuck by, and it's been close. I think in that first round, not only did Gonzaga have a tough go, I think um, Duke being a two seed, they had a close game. It, it was a couple of close games that shouldn't have been really close. So, uh, again, it makes for great entertainment, but for for us analysts, it's a tough job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine that. Do you uh, feel that the it's come up about uh, the the mid majors being able to make progress, and you know the the bigger schools having so many students uh, student athletes coming in, and it's like one and done, or maybe maybe two seasons. Do you think that's having an impact on those big schools? Uh, I think it is. I think there's a few factors, but the one you just mentioned is one. Right now, the NBA is more of a potential-based league rather than show me what you got type of league. So back, you know, even when I was playing early 2000s, guys had to produce. You had to be a, a an all-conference player. You had to have a certain amount of points. You had to have a, a certain amount of big games and big moments. And now, uh, you know, guys, you just have to be long and athletic and show a little flash of skill here and there, and now you're on the draft board. So it's a whole different game. So some of these kids are going to these big major schools. They're showing a little bit of potential. The athleticism part of the game is higher than, than what it used to be. So you get these kids that are just showing a, just a few glimpses of some things, and they're on draft boards, and they're leaving. So uh, while that's happening at, at Kentucky and Duke and UCLA and those schools, at the, the Creighton, the – if you look at even a Florida Gulf Coast yeah. right now, you know, it's teams that have upperclassmen, they have guys who've been there and, and just have gotten better and developed the chemistry. And so they're catching up. And in addition to all that, you just look at the world, uh, it's different, social media and, and just availability, availability on, on how to get better. You can go look at different basketball tutorials and drills. And so a lot of those smaller schools that may not have the money that the bigger schools have, they, they find ways to go out and get the things they need. And you just get on the internet or, you know, it's easy to connect with certain people. So it's just, it, it's equalizing everything. Right. So you feel that the the fact that a, a young guy can be, I don't know, at the age of 12 and start looking at videos and working on things means that yeah. he's not requiring the coaching to get to that certain level to be competitive. Well, yeah, it, it does help. It, it minimizes the need for certain situations like uh, coaching and uh, other tutelage that, that you would need if you didn't have the means of finding that over the Internet. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's making it uh, more accessible. It, it's making it easier for people to get better. Now, the thing with that is if, if it does it for one person, it does it for everybody. So it's, it's given everybody a more playing field, and I think that's what you're seeing. Even you look at the NCAA and some of the games, nothing's really an upset anymore because it's, it's really equalizing the playing field. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you think that that's going to continue for the Sweet 16? Uh, I, I do. I do. I don't see any reason to change now. It's been going off since the first game this season. Right. So I think continue. Um there's some big names still in the tournament, Louisville being the one seed and, and Syracuse being high up there. Although they're a four seed, they're a really good team. You know, Duke still alive. Indiana being a one seed, they're still alive. Miami, a two seed, that's alive. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see any of those teams that I just called win the tournament. It's, wow. just, it's, just, it's just that kind of season. All right. And you uh, think Florida Gulf Coast are going to be able to continue that run? It, it, it's really interesting. Um, it could go one or two ways for them, of course. Uh, they can continue the run. They, they, so, so right now, they're in a different realm than they've ever been in, and not just because they're winning, but they're receiving a different level of attention than any of those kids have ever experienced. Yeah. The, 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 kids, the kids at UCLA, at Kentucky, and Duke, when they're in high school, 
they're used to the media. They get it from there. You know, they, they're, they're in newspaper articles. They're the big man on campus. They're used to that attention. So when they get to college, it doesn't really phase them as much. Yeah. Now, a kid at Florida Falls is a kid that most likely wasn't recruited very high. So these kids go from never getting that type of media attention to getting it at pretty much the highest level, Yeah. being featured on his pen outside the line. So the question is going to be, how do they respond? Does it make them hungry for it? Do they say, oh, my goodness, I've never experienced anything like this. I do not want it to go away. So we're going to do whatever we have to do to find a way to win this game. Or are they back on campus a little relaxed, feeling like they've already reached the top of the hill? So that's going to be the question. Usually that thing is answered in the first few minutes of play. You see how they come out, what kind of energy, what kind of attentiveness, focus they have. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. Do you think their story will – uh, start to influence other schools and make them believe that they can do it as well? Totally, totally well. It's it's one of those situations where, uh, you know, you may not believe it until you see it. So had you written this script prior to the season that a number 15 seed is going to be in the 216, it's like, okay, yeah, right. But now that it's happened and, and you see it and you're one of those smaller schools that are able to see this, it serves as an inspiration for them. And, and what's happening right now here in our country is um, a lot of people are rallying behind Florida Gulf Coast because ah. everyone loves, you know, everybody loves the story of the underdog and yeah. and they play an exciting brand of basketball. It's not like this is just some bad team getting lucky winning games. They yeah. play exciting basketball and they've earned their victories. Yeah, yeah. Do you think now, because there was a lot of people talking about the brackets and, and who's in and this team should have been in and that team uh, – you know, made it, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think now that's going to silence a lot of people and it's going to be more of a, okay, well, let's just see how it goes? It's the same thing every year. There's always a few teams that could have gotten in and should have. I remember uh, two years ago, the University of Colorado over in the Pac-12, they had over 20 wins. They had a really good resume, and they didn't make the NCAA tournament. The coach was absolutely appalled. They were shocked. And and there's a number of schools that go through that each year. So you're always going to have that regardless. But it does help when you see some of these teams, like the Florida Gulf Coast again, and and LaSalle, who's still playing. When you see them get into the tournament and make the noise they make, then then it makes you say, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of upset that this team didn't get in or, or we didn't get in, but the committee must have done something a a little bit right because there's some teams have success that I didn't think would have success. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the games this, you know, this uh, Sweet 16 will, they'll continue to be good games? I think so. I think think it might be one of the highest rated uh, watched Sweet 16s that that we've had just because of the teams that are in there and the the potential quote-unquote upsets that may take place, Um, especially after that Florida Gulf Coast probably six, seven times already, but it's because they're the team, they're the team of the week right now. You know, they're the team that you turn on ESPN or any sporting news network, you hear their name. I think everybody wants to see how they're going to respond and can they actually do it? Can they go Elite Eight? Can they go Final Four? Because if that, it's going to blow up. Yeah, yeah. Would you, <laughs> would you put? Any money on any team, or would you just no, no, no? I can answer that before you before you finish it. <laughs> no, and, and and I'm telling you, with the amount of uncertainty, I don't know that any coach or even fan would confidently wager money or, or something of valuable possession in support of their team. Nobody yeah. knows. You just don't know. Well, that means it's going to be good. Yeah, it is. It's going to be. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait for tomorrow's game. You know, not only because of all the parity and stuff, but because there are still two Pac-12 teams alive. You know, being a Pac-12 analyst and following the conference, you know, we you know, we got Arizona and Oregon still in there, and they're both playing very well. They've they've won their games in somewhat dominant fashion. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how Arizona does tomorrow, how Oregon does Friday. Yeah. 